considering Nazareth is just a few miles that way. I'm at the southern tip of Sea of Galilee. The Jordan River flows in at the very north and it flows out here at the south. And this is the creek bed where David grabbed his stone. remarkable to me when you view that passage in the setting I'm in right now. And it's in this cave where the two silver scrolls were found in the 70s and they are the oldest written biblical texts uh, in existence. I grew up reading about these places and uh, pilgrimage here is a part of, of what people have been doing with their faith for, for millennia now. Israel sits at the crossroads of Africa, Asia, and Europe. The channeling effects of the Mediterranean and Arabian desert made modern Israel the bridge for the ancients and even those before them. Neanderthals and prehumans coexisted here when both tried to cross through here. More recently, the great civilizations of antiquity were born here in Egypt and in Mesopotamia. As for the biblical story, it really picks up when Abraham was called to the promised land. By the time of Christ, the land had remnants from the numerous invaders over the centuries. And as for modern day Israel, it begins during World War I and the defeat of the Ottoman Empire. This was the time of the British officer T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence resonates with me for many reasons and was squarely on my mind when I reached the Gulf of Aqaba, the site of his most famous military victory. The State of Israel was eventually founded in 1948. However, within its borders today, there are disputed areas that travelers should be aware of. The Palestinian Gaza Strip and West Bank. One last piece of information relevant to anyone traveling through here, especially on a bicycle, is the Dead Sea Transform. The earth literally unzipped itself when the Arabian plate broke off from the African plate, forming a deep valley. At the bottom is the lowest dry land on earth. Good and bad, technical and harsh environmentally, but when you move up and down it, you're literally on the side of tectonic plates. This is both rare and very cool. In a nutshell, humans have traveled this land from the beginning. And with them always, their ideas of living. Now, it's my turn. Riding my bicycle all across Israel. That's why you want to be on the vlog. Why not? I love Israel. Oh, 
so here I am getting ready to start on this adventure rode down here about six miles from my hotel so this is the official start point so I'm ready to get going I'm excited uh, so off to it following the green pans I headed southwest down into the Elaw Valley it started out on gravel roads and they were nice but I knew they would soon end and the hiking trails would pick up and this proved to be rather tough That was tough. I can't do many more like that. I hope there's not any. And on the way down, I also learned that I was not alone. I think they know I'm here. But I eventually made it down into the valley. So I'm in the Elaw Valley in the basin. Uh, and behind me, you can see a creek, a dried up creek bed with small stones. So this area, the valley with the fortresses on either side is where the battle of David and Goliath happened. So that's recorded in 1 Samuel. And the Israelites had the north part and the hill up here. And there's an old fortress up there that I'm going to go to of Elah Fortress. And it's not sure whether or not they, uh, that fortress was there. Uh, during the battle of David and Goliath, but according to 1st Samuel the Israelites had this hill and this side of the valley and then on this side There's ruins up here Azekah and then I just came from down this way uh, Tel Soko and the Philistines occupied the southern part in the hills the Israelites occupied the northern part in the hills and they met in the valley for 40 days. Goliath would challenge the Israelites to send out their best. Nobody came out. And David, the shepherd boy, uh, came out with a sling and told Goliath, you come at me with sword, spear, and javelin. I come at you in the name of the Lord Almighty. So this is where that battle happened. And this is the creek bed where David grabbed his stone. I continued on to my first UNESCO World Heritage Site, the Land of the Caves, Bet Gavra Marisha National Park. All these caves are all hand cut and were occupied for over 1600 years. This cave is the Dove Cave. There are about 500 caves in total, totaling over 740 acres. As the day started to draw to an end, I was thankful for being in it and present. I was thankful for not hurting myself on that overnight hike a bike. And I was thankful I didn't break the bike, but that I believe turned out to be premature. I believe I did crack the frame that night, but I just didn't know it yet. This is the end of day one. It was a long day. It was a good day, but it was a long day. Uh, started out rough. It did not help uh, having to hike that bike for four hours. It just set the tone. Legs are feeling it, but oh well, it'll get better. I'm um, just found a spot here on one of these next one of these gravel roads and just uh, laying up for the night. Going to get a good night's sleep. So here's looking forward to day number two. The goal today, following the green markers, uh, was to go south to Beersheba, which sits on the northern edge of the Negev Desert, and visit the ruins of Tel Sheba, then head straight east to the Dead Sea. 
The Iron Age ruins of Tel Shiva are impressive for sure. But the real story to me is what happened here much earlier in this general area. Beersheba is unique. There is no other place in the world that can make the claim it does. And that is, is if you take Judaism, Christianity, and Islam and trace them back in time and space, all three intersect here in Beersheba. And as I walk around and I'm thinking about this and I'm, and I'm thinking it's hard to find a single chapter in a single book that has had more of an impact on the ideas of living than Genesis chapter 21. But as much as I enjoyed touring the ruins, it was time to move on. I had the side of the African plate to ride down. It was fun and I finally made it down and as expected it was hotter at the bottom and the air was thicker and the sun was setting so it was time to find a place to sleep. It's the end of day two, much better day than yesterday, uh, much better. I'm on the shore of the Dead Sea looking across at Jordan, stars are out. The towns up in the mountains over there are lit up. And I just found this little uh, turn off on the road here that's hidden. And uh, bedding down for the night. So, day two in the books. I got an early start to beat the heat, climbing back up to sea level. But also I was excited to get to the destination of the day, the Moa Fortress. This fortress, another UNESCO World Heritage Site, lies on the ancient incense route. Moa is a top three destination for me on this entire trip. One of the earliest connections humans ever made was that if something smelled bad, then it was bad for you. Garbage, rotting food, foul water, all of it smelled bad, and all of it would make you sick or even kill you not knowing anything about bacteria, the ancients assigned the cause to invisible evil spirits contained within the invisible bad smell. In short, the evil spirits and the smell would kill them. So how do you fight bad smells and their evil spirits? With pleasing smells and their good spirits. So temples in the ancient world looked clean and most importantly, they smelled clean through burning of incense. Thousands of temples around the Mediterranean basin in Mesopotamia burned incense night and day. One temple, just one, in Babylon was reported to burn 20 tons of incense in just one year. 20 tons! The most popular incense were frankincense and myrrh. And because of their demand, they were worth more than gold, literally. So here's the problem. Frankincense and myrrh are tree resins. And the trees they come from are not found anywhere around the Mediterranean. The trees only grow in the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula and the east coast of Africa, some 2,000 miles to the south and on the other side of the vast Arabian desert. So someone had to go get them and haul them north. Enter the desert long road truckers of the ancient world, the caravanners, with their camel and their cargo. Because the cargo was so valuable, fortresses were built along the route. Some fortress complexes also had what were called caravanserai, an Arabic word that translates to caravanner's palace, i.e. hotel. Moa has fortress ruins and a hotel ruin. In addition, Moa is the first fortress the caravanners would come to in southern Judea as they made their trek up from Arabia. That is, Moa is the first fortress in the promised land. Frankincense, myrrh, vegetable oil, 
lighter, candle, the bottom to a soda can, and a tuna can that I have cut out. This is part of my wood gasifying camp stove that I brought. This is how you burn incense in the middle of the desert at the Moa Fortress. So I'm up in the fortress right now, up high to protect it. And you can see there that square outline. That's the caravanserai. That's the uh, hotel for travelers. So they would st store the, the goods, the incense up here in the fortress. And then they would bed down there for the night. So what I'm gonna do when the sun gets almost down is I'm gonna go down there and spread a tarp out and just lay there and watch the stars for a few hours and then I'm gonna get up and uh, head on down the road. So good riding day, bad gear day. Bike light is definitely broke. Also my gallon jug sprung a leak. So it's got a hole in it. Hopefully I super glued it up and duct taped it and have it strapped on there the right way to where it won't give me a problem. Uh, and then the worst part was I lost my wedding band. So I have, I made one, a new one out of uh, duct tape, which I don't know, it'll work. But I was riding along, looked down, it wasn't there. I think what happened was I, it got lubed up with the sunscreen and was just loose and just slipped right on off down on the road. Uh, so anyway, good riding day, bad gear day, but I'm, I'm patching things up and making do. Uh, and I'm just going to lay here and watch the stars come out in this caravanner's hotel that people first started sleeping in 2,200 years ago. So that's pretty cool. Day four would keep me heading south to Timna Park, where there is a full-scale replica of the tabernacle. So the Egyptians, Mesopotamians, and later the Greeks and Romans all had visible gods. Gods of the sky, sun, moon, war, earth, fertility, etc., etc. But unlike all of them, Abraham's God, Yahweh, was not represented physically in his creation. For this reason, Abraham's God was called the invisible God. In fact, for a period of time in the early church, Christians were the ones labeled atheists because they didn't believe in any visible God. But despite all that, the God of the Israelites did come to earth and in doing so had an earthly dwelling place. That place was the tabernacle. Eventually in time, King Solomon built a permanent earthly dwelling place for God, Solomon's temple, or the first temple on what is present-day Temple Mount in East Jerusalem. Into day four, I'm in a campground just hanging out in Timna next to Tabernacle. I had a good day, good day of riding. Tomorrow, day five, Gulf of Aqaba. I left at midnight and continued south to a lot. On this day, my thoughts are squarely on Lawrence of Arabia. Somewhat on how he lived, because his military conquest of Aqaba is legendary, but primarily on how he died. In 2019, I had a cycling accident and broke my neck in multiple places. I was riding the same bike and wearing the same helmet that I have on this trip. The dents are here and here. Although severely injured, there is no doubt that that helmet saved my life. So it's that timeless question, Am I here today because some supreme being stepped in and made it so? Or am I here today because of simple random luck? We each have our own answers for that. But to me, the far more important question is, am I prepared right here, right now, for the moment that I find that out? But anyway, back to Lawrence and his death. After his military career, Lawrence retired country life in southwest England. He was an avid motorcyclist. One day while riding in the country he crashed. He was not wearing a helmet because back then, 1935, the safety helmet had not yet been invented. 
Lawrence suffered massive head trauma. For six days, his neurosurgeon, Dr. Hugh Carnes, tried in vain to save his life. Dr. Carnes was so deeply affected by the experience that he concluded most traumatic head injuries, like Lawrence's, could largely be avoided with the use of a safety crash helmet. With that epiphany, he made it his professional mission to fix it. He was very successful. If you look at who in history is credited with the development of the crash helmet, like the one that saved my life three years ago, it is T.E. Lawrence's neurosurgeon, Sir Hugh Carnes. So of all the thoughts I have on these ideas of living, I think the most fundamental one is this. Most of all, I thank God that I'm still here. So, time to move on. The Israelites wandered in these deserts for 40 years. After four days, I'd had enough. It was time to get north to Galilee. So I rented a car that I would eventually drop off in Afula in the Jezreel Valley in 48 hours. Between now and then, I camped at En Gedi and visited several sites in the West Bank. Day tripping from my campground, Masada was first up. It was built as a mountain palace by King Herod. Later, this was the site of the last battle of the first Jewish Roman war. For the better part of two years, the Romans built a wall around the mountain to prevent Jews from escaping and then built a giant siege ramp up to the fortress. When the Romans finally broke through, the Jews had chosen mass suicide rather than capture. Next stop was Qumran in the caves where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. I'm in the West Bank, Muslim of Israel, Judaism, at the traditional baptism site of Jesus, Christianity. The Jordan River, quite small today because of all the water being pulled out up north, but you can see a water level line. 10 years ago, it was up to that mark on that wall, but now there's not much there. This is West Bank of Israel. Across the water is Jordan. Next, Jericho with its famous walls. And finally, an effortless float in the Dead Sea. I just dropped the rental car off. I'm in Afula. Look. Grass. This is a lot better than the desert. Windy, but cool. Nice view of the valley. Today would take me to the ruins of Bet Shean and then finally to the Sea of Galilee. Hello. Hi. Hello. So, I ended up in the wrong place around Bet Shean. I stumbled on an archeological site where some conservation work was being done on a synagogue that dates to the 300s. I chatted with the archeologist for a while and finally it came out. Can I help? You know what these are? 
toilets. It's a public latrine. This seems crude uh, to me when I'm sitting on my couch at home, but given uh, the experiences lately, these are really nice. So I'm at the southern tip of the Sea of Galilee. The Jordan River flows in at the very north, and it flows out here at the south, down to the Dead Sea. And that western side, from the Jordan River to the Jordan River, the whole western side was Jewish. And on the east side, in the northeast corner, what was known as Galantis. And on the southeast corner, the Decapolis, Roman cities. So these were the Gentile regions. And when we read in the scripture about Jesus getting in a boat and going to the other side, uh, he's going from Jewish sides to Gentile sides and back and forth, and his teachings reflect that. So I'm gonna ride in a counterclockwise loop uh, around this whole lake over the next uh, day, or two days maybe. But this is the Sea of Galilee, finally made it. And it's windy. Calm the storms, calm the winds. I am heading up the east coast of Sea of Galilee. So it was a good day. The digging with the conservation group was awesome. Uh, and then finally getting to the Sea of Galilee was just fantastic. Had a great day. Today would take me to Bethsaida and then up through the Hula Valley to Dan at the northern tip of Israel. I just came through Kersey and uh, there's a whole bunch of wild pigs there. What, what are the odds of that? That was pretty amazing. Bethsaida had a nice display of carved stones with arrows pointing to the various places visible around the Sea of Galilee and was a good way of orientating you to the area. Starting to climb out of here. Eh, it's hot and steep. I've come, to, come up about a little under 500 feet, 480 feet. So, making my way. So, I'm um, just outside of Dan. This is a turning point here tonight. Uh, up until this point, every pedal stroke has been leading away from Jerusalem. And uh, tomorrow is when I start uh, pedaling towards the finish line instead of away from it. And I'm gonna get a good night's sleep and uh, get at it tomorrow. First up today is visiting Tel Dan Nature Reserve and the archaeological ruins of Tel Dan and then I would head back to the Sea of Galilee. On Tel Dan Reserve is Abraham's Gate, one of Israel's most coveted historical ruins. The gate dates to the Canaanite period, a time when Abraham and Lot were in Dan. This is also where the Tel Dan Stella was found in 1993. This stella is likely the oldest and perhaps only extra biblical reference to King David ever found. I'm headed south towards Jerusalem. Feels good. On my way back south, I visited Tel Hazor, another UNESCO World Heritage Site, and dates back to the middle Canaanite period. That's about 3,800 years ago. I finally made it back to the sea and rode down the northern slopes where Christ most likely gave his Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. And I eventually made it uh, with a much deserved bath 
and an open place to camp for the night. Today started on the Jesus Trail and visiting the rest of the Evangelical Triangle of Jesus's ministry. The trail started out nice, but then like a lot of this trip, uh, Satan took it over and it became unrideable. So far, the Jesus Trail, it's not a walk in the park. But I eventually made it to the sites. I then continued on and stopped at Ganosar to see the 2,000 year old fishing boat. I carried on through Tiberias and started the long climb out of the valley. My goal was to get up and over Hatin Mountain, the famous Horns of Hatin. So this section is a leading contender for the low point on this entire trip. The next 20 hours would push me physically almost to the edge. The bike was being stressed way past its limits too. This is uh, kind of tough. It's like 20% grade and there's thorns everywhere. I'm more worried about flat tire than anything, but I get up it. Heck of a view. So I'm about halfway up this mountain and the sun's going down and it's so steep I had to carry my bike and bag separate and uh, when I was carrying the water bottle in my bags I tripped and uh, busted. So I'm going to have to deal with that tomorrow. I got a great view of the valley here to, to camp out. Yeah, stinks that I broke that, but I have a backup plan for it. So we'll put it in action tomorrow. So, yeah. Today's goal was getting over and down Hatin, then riding through Nazareth and finally finishing at Zapori Park. Well, I've been pushing the limits of this bike this whole trip and it finally broke. The frame, seat binder, cracked. After a range of thoughts and emotions, I was determined to not stop. I decided it was still rideable, just couldn't sit down and carried on. I rolled into Nazareth feeling about half past dead and I carried on to Zapori where I could lay my head. End of day 12. I'm camped out here on the Israeli National Trail, just outside of Zippori National Park, Zephoris. So I'll hit that in the morning. And that's a top three for me here. I'm really looking forward to it. I think I could have got here a lot earlier before it closed, but I wouldn't have had time. So I'm gonna camp out here, long day. Bike broke, still rideable, but not ideal. And uh, here's to sleeping under the stars and having another day tomorrow. Today would be Sephora and then on to the Mediterranean coast. Sephora was destroyed during a Jewish revolt just prior to Christ's birth. Shortly after Christ's birth, King Herod died and his son Antipas would eventually start rebuilding it. Today in the ruins, there are numerous beautiful mosaics still sitting in place, a theater, and even a castle from the Crusader period. But what draws most attention are the Roman roads with grooves worn into the paving stones from the seemingly endless procession of Roman wagons. But as incredible as the ruins are, what I am thinking about is whose hands helped 
to build these structures. And as I wander around, I am looking for a 100.00% perfectly cut stone. There's three things that scholars unanimously agree on today about Jesus. Secular scholars. One, that he was a real person. And two, he was baptized by John the Baptist. And three, he was crucified by the Romans, Pontius Pilate. <clears throat> I think it's also nearly unanimously agreed on that he was a Galilean from the Galilee area. And this was the jewel of Galilee here. And considering Nazareth is just a few miles that way, and there was so much building going on in this Jewel of the Galilee, Sephora, Sephora here during the time of Jesus when he was a kid. And considering that his father and him were tectons, which in the West we usually equate that with carpentry, woodwork, but tecton means stonework. So I think it's entirely possible that Jesus helped build this and his father helped build this. I made it to the Mediterranean. It's windy. But I made it. I'm set up here on the beach. The Mediterranean, laying in the sand. On my tarp. The water is maybe 50 feet away. This is how day 13 ends. It's a good day. Down the beach to Caesarea Maritima and then on to Tel Aviv. Made it to Caesarea, another of King Herod's massive building projects. I'm in the Hippodrome and the horses would start all the way down there. They had gates for them. This was the main uh, attraction, entertainment for the crowds besides the theater. This is the ruins of the Praetorium. Uh, <clears throat> Police guard houses right next to the Hippodrome. Paul was imprisoned here. The exact location in Caesarea is not known, but likely could be here in the police building. Caesarea is also the uh, place where, in Acts, Cornelius was baptized, the first Christian Gentile baptism uh, when Peter received the calling to come up here uh, to meet with the Roman centurion Cornelius. So there's a lot of church history here, a lot of New Testament post-resurrection history, as well as a lot of Roman history. And then finally I worked my way south. It was tough in the sand, which was more like powder than sand. And the route was also filled with dead ends, it made me turn around, and it made for a very long day. I'm on the outskirts of Tel Aviv, uh, inland, more. It was just too tough to, to bike on the shore. It's just too hard to bike around here, and the construction on 6 just really messed me up. I didn't feel safe riding it. So I came in shore, inland, on Route 4, which is a beautiful bike road. Had a nice ride in. I'm in a, a town in this awesome, looks like a bus shelter or some kind of shelter and I'm probably just going to sit here and power nap and uh, tomorrow I think I'm going to ride around Tel Aviv and then that's probably going to be it. We'll see what happens but I think I'm getting close to the end. Mama, put my
I'm uh, in the the main park here in Tel Aviv. They have a camping section where you can just put up a tent and sleep. So I'm not putting up a tent, but I'm sleeping here right under the stars. It's a beautiful night. Uh, my legs are shot. <laughs> they're they're done. Uh, I tooled around today uh, up and down the coast and it was just, I can tell, I, I think it's been 140 miles since my seat broke. And that's a lot of miles on a heavy loaded bike on my legs right now, the saddle. I think tomorrow I'm going to call it, I'm going to get a cab to Jerusalem and uh, start day tripping. I had a great day. End of day 15. I'm in the Hinnom Valley at a site called Katef Hinnom. And behind me is an archeological site uh, that was excavated in the 70s and it's a cave. There's a series of caves here, burial caves. And this cave here is uh, Cave 24. And this is where the two silver scrolls, amulets, were found. And they date to the first temple period. And they are the oldest known written biblical texts uh, in existence. I'm on the Mount of Olives. Temple Mount is just to my west. And to my east, we can't see it, but it would be Bethany, the, the place where Christ stayed during, during the uh, last week of his life during Passion Week. And every morning he would get up and walk to, from Bethany to Temple Mount, over the Mount of Olives with his disciples teaching. And he would go to the temple and teach during the day and then walk back at night. Due south, I don't know if you can see it or not on the camera, but just over that ridge, there's a flat top cone mountain just over there seven miles away that's the Herodian that is King Herod's uh, one of his uh, palaces it's where he was buried uh, and it's a man-made mountain Herod made it he uh, that spot where that mountain is is very special to him because of things that happened to him when he was younger and so he wanted that very spot and being Herod he wanted it big and magnificent so what he did is he had his there was a mountain nearby it but not on that spot. So what he did is he had his workers cut the top off that mountain and move it. He moved a mountain and built a mountain. So that is uh, partially a man-made mountain that Herod made. It was on one of these trips with Christ and his disciples uh, when he walked to Temple Mount uh, preaching that he recorded one of uh, his most famous sayings, one of them that Christians say all the time regarding how faith can move mountains. And it's in Matthew uh, 21, 21. And with this man-made Herodian mountain in the backdrop on the Mount of Olives and the Dead Sea, which is just past it, although I can't see it today, the Herodian and the Dead Sea, Christ said this, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. And I think it's quite remarkable that the definitive this was used by Christ in view of a man-made mountain that was moved by Herod and built by Herod just in front of the Dead Sea. It's remarkable um, to me when you view that passage in the setting I'm in right now. The Al-Aska Mosque, which is Islam, sits on Temple Mount, Judaism, and after the First Crusade became the headquarters of the Knights Templars, Christian. The Knights Templars were a monastic order, monks, whose original name was the Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ in the Temple of Solomon. This is where the name Templars comes from. During the time of persecution in the early church, numerous Christians actually volunteered to be killed. 
To them, martyrdom was the one true witness to their faith in Christ. When persecution ended, and thus martyrdom was no longer available, monasticism developed and grew. If one could no longer die in the name of Christ, the next best way to witness would be a life devoted to poverty and prayer. Spurred by the needs of the crusade and its just war, the poor fellow soldiers of Christ and the Temple of Solomon, Templars, were formed. Monks devoted to poverty and dying on the battlefield in the name of Christ as their form of witness. Being here uh, in this spot, reflecting on all of that, the Templarism, the Crusades, the pilgrimage, the holy sites, the role of, of monasticism and, and trying to, to live the best Christian life that you think you can, all of that comes together right here in this spot. in the darkness couldn't see the light didn't think I had the strength to put up any kind of fire now I'm back standing on my two feet found victory on the cross never faced defeat just want to thank my family all they done for me For all my happy friends For keeping me company I didn't realize that many cared And I felt it all in the prayers Had my fair share of laughs And my fair share of tears But most of all I thank God I'm still here Well, I was a lonesome traveler on a long, lonely road. There were times I could feel my heart start going cold. And that's all changed. Nowadays I put on a smile, and it keeps getting bigger for every single mile. Just wanna thank my family. All they done for me for All my happy friends For keeping me company Didn't realize that many cared And I felt it all in the prayers Had my fair share of laughs My fair share of tears But most of all I thank God I'm still here Company didn't realize that many cared, and I felt it all in the prayers. Had my fair share of laughs, my fair share of tears, but most of all, I thank God I'm still here. But most of all, I thank God. I'm still here. I love going on these trips, especially by bike. Uh, I love the initial thought of a far off place and the research to try and figure out what it might be like and then the actual experience of going through it. The highs and the lows. And then I also love it when they come to an end because that means you get to go home and you get to take all those experiences with you. But the best part about the end of a trip is that you can start thinking about the next one. And in that sense, I love it when they're done.